How do reimbursement rates from the insurer to the hospital or to the doctor influence doctor behavior, uh, physician services, hospital services? And sometimes we think of in our head financial incentives as being this carrot that um, the insurers dangle in front of the doctor to get the, the doctor to do things. But in practice, doctors are not just always going after the next penny, always going after the next 10 bucks of reimbursement rate. That's not really how it works. Um, most of doctors' time is actually not spent thinking about reimbursement rates and money. Most of their time is spent thinking about the patient. In which case, how does this actually work and how do insurers influence what happens in the hospital? Well, first of all, we need to think how does the money flow? And with hospitals, actually most of the money sort of comes in to the administration and the people who are uh, running the medical records and doing the books and looking at the finances. In essence, these are the people involved in hospital administration. Now, some of the money may go directly to the doctor. Like if you go to the hospital, one common setup is for insurers to pay the hospital some money and the doctor some money directly. That's not in every case, but it does happen. For this video, I'm mainly going to be focusing on the influence that the insurers have through the hospital administration. And of course, there's a lot of tension between hospital administrators and doctors. Uh, they don't always see eye to eye. But let's think about how can the money that comes in influence what services get offered, uh, the way doctors think, the way doctors uh, change their behavior a little bit at a time year after year. So one of the ways this can happen is that hospital administrators notice that the hospital is losing money. And they know that the hospital cannot do that year after year after year, or eventually the hospital will have to go bankrupt. That's a tragedy for everyone, including the doctors and the nurses and the patients. So nobody wants that. Hospital administration has a little bit of wiggle room, like on average hospital make about 3% above marginal cost. So one way of thinking about this is that one of the big jobs hospital administrators have is to make sure that the, the whole enterprise stays in operation. And they do that by looking at different sectors of the hospital. There's labor and delivery, there's labs, there's the cath lab, there is the um, ICU, there's the neonatal ICU. They have different departments within the hospital, and it's actually really difficult to tell for any given patient, are you losing money or making money? Because so many of the hospital services are people who are running around to different departments, juggling a whole bunch of different tasks, responding to different family members who have needs, and it's just really hard to parse out nurse time, doctor's time, technician's time, when these people are multitasking and juggling all of the time. But the hospital administrators have to figure out which departments seem to be money sinks, where you're just leaking money year after year, and which departments are cash cows that sort of make the hospital money year after year, and therefore can help to subsidize the units of the hospital that are losing money. Because in hospitals, there is so much cross-subsidization. Lucrative patients cross-subsidize less lucrative patients. Lucrative doctors cross-subsidize non-lucrative doctors or doctors who are just providing necessary care that's probably losing the hospital money. And it's this big balance that hospital administrators are trying to uh, make sure works out just so that they don't go out of business. Now, if the hospital looks like it's going to be losing money year after year, the administrators may have to cut one of the departments. They may have to say, we're getting rid of our emergency room, it's just too expensive to maintain, and we're just going to send those patients who once went here for emergencies to the next closest hospital. And of course, when we're looking at which departments are lucrative and which aren't, that's all going to depend on insurer reimbursement rates. Does the insurer pay lucratively for surgeries and very poorly for emergency room patients that don't do any procedures? 
well, that's going to show up in the books in some ways, even though you may not necessarily be able to figure out patient by patient or even disease by disease, which diseases are losing money and which are uh, making money. On average, you can look at the whole ER department and say, yeah, we're not m making much money for this entire group of patients and it's a super expensive part of our hospital to keep operating. So we're going to have to shut it down rather than keep operating at a loss. Now, the fact that that's a possibility, like close down of certain sectors of the hospital, is something that nobody wants, including the doctors. So the administrators actually may have some leverage over the doctors to say, you know what? Um, we've looked at the books and it does seem like on average we're doing too many cath labs or we're doing too many c-sections and we're losing money because of that if you can cut back on these particular expensive procedures based on our reimbursement rates not looking great or based on those being expensive procedures and reimbursement rates not really measuring up if you can tell them that ahead of time they may they may sort of keep in the back of their mind, well, we don't want to lose our emergency room. And if we can just be a little bit more stingy with giving out C-sections or giving out certain procedures, then maybe we can keep this hospital the way it is without losing the ER. Now, hospital administrators are more creative than that. They can try to nudge these doctors to do things differently in other ways as well. They can um, do research and show, actually, it's better if you do fewer C-sections because C-sections are not always healthy. So they can sort of try to compel the doctors using uh, existing medical research. And that may be a response to a financial incentive that has reduced reimbursement rates for C-sections. But it may also be partially medically uh, based. Now, that's kind of where things get a little bit tricky because you have information exchanged between these two groups that's both the medical literature, but also that has an intention to more align the financial incentives. And when you mix financial incentives and the truth about good medicine, well, could that go wrong? I'll just, I'll just leave the question out there. And then the last piece of this story that I think sometimes gets overlooked is if you look at what's actually happening on the floor of the hospital. The biggest determinant of that is what doctors perceive to be appropriate medical care. Doctors are the leaders in the industry and they develop their intuition about appropriate care based on their medical training, medical school, but also based on what they've seen doctors elsewhere doing, what leaders in the doctor industry do, which is of course why medical device companies and uh, drug companies target these leaders because they can actually influence the behavior of physicians in a way that will shape what happens within the hospital financially and otherwise. So the thing I want to point out here is could you get a situation where the reimbursement rates change such that one surgery is suddenly way more lucrative and another surgery is suddenly way less lucrative, even though perhaps on average these are equal surgeries, some patients are better for one, some patients are better for another, you would want only medical knowledge to go into that decision which one do you get. You want the patient most appropriate for that type of surgery to get it. But if, if the reimbursement rates make those two surgeries one way lucrative and one a money sink, what can potentially happen is the conversations that happen between the administrators and the doctors, where the doctors are like, we don't want to lose our ER, maybe I can sort of switch some of the patients from this surgery to this surgery. I think the step that we don't think about often enough is that the doctors have to feel good about what they're doing. They have to feel like they're doing good things for their patients. So in making that switch toward the more lucrative surgery, they're going to overemphasize in their heads, in their hearts, the benefits of that lucrative surgery and underemphasize the benefits and overemphasize the harms of the money suck uh, procedure. And what that can do over time, I think, is the doctor becomes convinced that it's actually way more appropriate to do a lot more of the lucrative surgery and way less appropriate to do more of the other.
And that that isn't um, in their heads motivated by financial incentives eventually. They forget financial incentives were there. They just think, okay, yeah, this is appropriate care. And they pass that intuition about appropriate care down to the next generation of doctors. So this is one of the worries I have is that these financial incentives that get sort of mixed into the system, in terms of real fear that everyone should have that the, the hospital's emergency department or labor and delivery will be shut down. And that that fear sort of looms over people in a way that trickles down into actual patient care. And this is just something to consider. Um, it's not necessarily all bad. Like if the insurers have good researchers who are keeping an eye on uh, the medical journals and good medical practice, this could actually align incentives better. It could sort of nudge doctors toward the more effective surgeries and away from the riskier surgeries and promote better care overall. So this isn't always 100% bad, but if you get um, financial interests targeting the insurers for the reimbursement rates or targeting the government as they set the insurance reimbursement rates for Medicare, you can get distortions in the system that go down just as deep as uh, doctor intuition about appropriateness of care. Yeah, I, I think that's enough about that. I, I, I think the thing I'm trying to communicate here is really financial incentives matter and it's not because doctors are after the money. It's because the capacity for the doctors in the hospitals to actually do good things for the patients depends on those reimbursement rates in a way that that threat of part of the hospital going bankrupt can trickle down in many ways.